So if we go through all of the renewal energy systems, one of them, the most oldest one, the one that's still in many parts of the world, the primary energy use, is wood. Plain old pieces of wood, firewood. It turns out in the U.S. only one quarter of one percent of homes heat their houses with wood. And almost every one of those cases, it's because the people have wood available pretty much for their own labor to go get it. You know, people live in a forest. For the rest of us, if you wanted to heat your house with wood, you have to buy it. And if you look at the economics, for the energy content of wood, it's much cheaper to buy coal or natural gas. And of course, if you have a centralized heating system where the natural gas comes into your house, the only reason to have a wood-burning fireplace that heats your home is because you like it, or you get the wood for free, or, you know, you just want to have wood. So if that small a percentage are actually using wood to heat their homes, what is this category that we showed on the graphics of total energy use, total renewal energy use, that says wood slash waste? And it's over two quads. That's something like 2% of U.S. energy use. It's a huge amount of energy. Well, it's not firewood. What it is, is the wood products from the paper and lumber industry. Just imagine, you've got to make two by fours out of a tree. What happens to the bark? What happens to the sawdust? What happens to the branches? All that is collected and actually turned into heat that runs the rest of the factory. Even more important is paper production. Paper is made out of wood. In particular, it's made out of the fibers in the wood. So what about all the sap, all the water content, all the other carbon things? Well, when you make paper, you end up in the pulping process making something called black liquor. Don't drink it, all right? But this black liquor is very easy to burn and is burned. So this energy content that you see from wood is not the people with their fireplaces. It's the paper product industry and the lumber industry. So on the topic of biomass then, what about intentionally growing biomass to be able to burn? For instance, we've been out in the cornfield, so I brought part of the cornfield into the studio. And this is what's left after the corn is harvested and dried. There's no piece of corn on here anymore. This is very lightweight, all right? And in the process of harvesting corn, all of this stuff is picked up. The combine picks it all up, chops it up, and throws it back on the field. What if you didn't throw it back on the field? What if you threw it in a truck and then took this to a power plant where they burned it and used the heat to make steam, to make electricity, and so forth? Is that cost efficient? Is that effective? Should we use our crop residue to make energy? Well, there's a couple problems with that. The first is just the volume and the density of the fuel and the density of the energy content. This stuff is, uh, is dry, it's hollow, it has a lot of volume, right, even if I kind of crush it up here. But this will fill up the truck pretty fast. And I would say the amount of fuel the truck has to use to be able to bring it to the uh, plant where they're going to burn it to turn it into steam is probably more than the energy you're going to get by trucking this stuff. A more important problem, however, is the things that go into making this in the first place, the minerals, the different nutrients. By chopping it up and putting it back on the field, that allows the better crops to be grown in the future years. That makes soil. That helps replace all of the parts of the corn that you didn't actually eat. So we're not going to take the crop residue to make it into an energy source. So what about growing something intentional that actually is uh, an enormous amount of biomass per acre? Well, one of the best plants for that is Miscanthus, Miscanthus gigantus. 
There's another way to make biofuels without directly affecting the food supply, and that's to make it out of cellulose, grass, green vegetable matter, not starches, not proteins like soybeans. This is a field of miscanthus. It's an amazing plant. Look at this. All this grew all by itself. It reseeds itself, and it's enormously tall. It's one of the most densest biofuels available. And of course, by breeding even different and better varieties, which they're doing for research here at the University of Illinois, you can actually um, produce an enormous amount of tons of cellulose per unit of land. Of course, this farmland is probably a waste. Corn and soybean have food uses beyond their uses for energy. But in many places of the country or the world where the farmland is not as rich, a crop like this to make ethanol or biodiesel or other alcohol-based fuels from plants, from just the green matter, from the grass clippings, from the cellulose, would be phenomenal. There's only one little problem. Right now, we don't really know how to do it very well. The costs are still pretty high. Costs are always high at the start of a new field of research and endeavor. This has the ability to be able to grow fuel without hurting food. This is much older miscanthus. Every year it'll grow taller and bigger. That's why it can make more cellulose, more plant mass per year than any other crop. So if you grow miscanthus, you can get 20 tons per acre. That's over twice as much mass as you get from corn, which is otherwise one of the king crops. In Illinois, in our beautiful fertile soil here in Champaign County, you can even get 26 tons per acre. What about taking this, drying it, and burning it? Well, you can do it. But you still have the problem of transportation. It still is a low-density fuel. And in the end, taking that and just using it as something you can burn Yes, it's renewable, but generally that is not the highest and best use if you want to grow biomass. What you really want to do with this stuff is convert it to alcohol directly. This field is called cellulitic ethanol production. You take just plain grass clippings or grass from the acanthus plant or any type of biomass, any type of cellulose. Treat it with enzymes, turn it into glucose, and then you have sugar. And once you have sugar, you can do the same process that you do with corn, which are basically starches or sugars, and take it and ferment it, and then after fermenting it, distill it, and do the whole process that we do now using corn to make fuel that you could do with any type of biomass. And since you can grow mythcanthus at a much higher rate than you can grow the biomass from corn, and you can use the entire plant, you can actually get something like four times as much ethanol from an acre grown in mythcanthus than you can get from an acre grown of corn. Four times. That's the promise of cellulitic ethanol. And you might think, wow, you can get, uh, you can grow it anywhere. You don't even need the best farmland. It grows like crazy. It reseeds itself. Why not use it? The problem right now is the capital cost. Even though you can get more than twice as much biomass, which in the end would give you four times as much alcohol, at the moment, the cost structure is prohibitive. Long ago, cellulitic ethanol was indeed used, and there was a process of adding acid to the cellulose to break it up into the pieces that you need to be able to um, ferment. The enzymatic process, using an enzyme to do that instead of acid, is much more cost-effective. However, 
it is still prohibitively expensive. The capital cost today, in 2014, to make a cellulitic ethanol plant is something on the order of a capital cost that would amortize to $7 a gallon. If you remember, the cost for an ethanol production plant is significantly less than $1 per gallon. And this means when fuel is clearly much less than $7 per gallon, it's not economically uh, wise to build a cellulitic ethanol plant today. Huge amounts of research are going into this field because of its enormous potential. And one would hope that as processes improve, or maybe whole new processes are invented, and by government investment one could get into a larger economy of scale, that these types of costs can come down. As of today, they're not there, but it's certainly something to look forward to in the future.